So when we say, okay, we want to deliver a differentiated story to a particular group of people, well, what does that mean, building an audience? Building an audience means that they've given you some kind of opt-in permission, let's say through subscribing to your email newsletter, that they would say, okay, yeah, please send me your information. They're basically subscribing to your marketing, although it's marketing so good it doesn't feel like marketing. Welcome to the Schweiky Media Expert webinar series where we team up with leading marketing and publishing experts to provide you with tips and best practices to help you grow your business and stay on the cutting edge. Welcome to the show. Hello, everyone. I'm here today with Joe Polizzi, the godfather of content marketing and the founder of Content Marketing Institute, which is the leading education and training organization for content marketing and also includes the largest in-person content marketing event in the world, which is named Content Marketing World. Joe also just released his fifth book called Killing Marketing, and if you ever see Joe in person, he will definitely be wearing orange. Joe, how are you doing today? David, thanks for having me, and I'm, I know people can't see me, but I'm also wearing orange right oh. now. All head to toe? Uh, you know, I got an orange hat, I got an orange watch on, an orange shirt. I think that's probably enough. Well, all right. Well, actually, I have my content marketing orange pen I'm writing with today. There you go. There, there you go. And, yeah, yeah, I'm excited. Today, uh, everyone, we're going to be talking about the hottest topics and takeaways from CM World 2017, which just ended uh, about a week or a couple weeks ago. So we have the man – who knows the most about what happened at his own conference. So uh, I want to just kind of dig right in, and we're going to get into some of the hottest topics and takeaways. But before we go there, Joe, um, tell everybody a little bit about the conference. I I'm such a big fan, but, uh, you know, just talk a little bit about it and, and who it might be good for. Sure, yeah. I mean, we started Content Marketing World as, you know, hoping to get 100 people to come to Cleveland in 2011. And that year, uh, 600, over 600 attended, and this year, over 3,500 from 50 countries came uh, to talk about how they can communicate more effectively with their customers. We call it content marketing world, but every company has this issue, and instead of interrupting our customers, they want valuable, relevant content on a consistent basis, but a lot of companies don't know how to do that. So we brought in over 200 speakers from all over the world to, to educate and teach uh, the people come, the marketing professionals coming in, you know, what they need to know. And we also try to have a really good time as well, as you know, a lot of, a lot of dance parties, <laughs> yeah. a lot of food, a lot of drink, a lot of networking time. But uh, it's basically, if content marketing had a holiday, it would be content marketing. <laughs> so that's what we do. And who, who who would be some attendees? A lot of people don't have the title content marketing in their title, right? You are, yeah, you, you work in, you work in marketing, you work in PR, you work in communications, this event is for you. It's, it, you don't have to be creating content necessarily, although a lot of the attendees are create, they're working on blogs and podcasts and webinars and print magazines and they're doing all those types of things. But you also have marketing professionals that are in senior titles that are creating strategies around this and how do we integrate it? How do we move away from how we've been marketing for so many years so that we can it, deliver really valuable experiences to our customers on a regular basis. So we do have some C-level folks there, uh, but most of the people are the doers. They're the marketers, they're the PR professionals, they're the communication folks that are trying to communicate directly with their audience to see some profitable behavior. Am I gonna, can I sell more stuff online? Uh, can I see some positive behavior? Can I get more uh, customers to come back to us, customer retention and loyalty? all those types of things. And we had over a hundred sessions this year. So you pretty much find a little bit of everything. And probably for the first year this year, we had some salespeople attend too. And sales marketing integration is mm -hmm. more important than ever before. So yeah. And, and one other uh, uh, field, I think you didn't quite mention it might fall into communication, but if you're a writer, if you're a journalist, uh, there was specific uh, information there. And, and not only that, if you're a writer in this day and age, you got to have all of this in mind. You got to have the content marketing in mind. You got to have the SEO in mind. You got to know all that. And you guys talk about all that. So, if you're a writer, highly suggest uh, as well. Well, thank all you. Right. I mean, on the, on the just on the writing side, no, I keep talking. On the writing side, um, most of the jobs for writers today are on the corporate side. So that's mm -hmm. why an event like this, to your point, is so so important. Mm -hmm. So it teaches you how to work more with the corporate side. Absolutely, absolutely. All right. Well, very cool. Um, What's your top takeaway this year? Well, you know it. I mean, you were there for my opening keynote where I talked about you know, some of our latest research findings between Content Marketing Institute and Marketing Profs. And the one big finding that I thought was interesting is those that say they're successful 
doing really, really well with content marketing and seeing results are focused, 90% of those companies are focused on building audiences. And not that, you know, not, not that, uh, you know, work in the funnel isn't important and getting more traffic and doing those sort of things, but what we've seen with the most innovative companies is they're focused on building audiences that know, like, and trust them, and then they see a positive behavior change in those uh, organizations, in, in those uh, attend or those um, subscribers over time, which is really, really critical. So the belief is, and as we sort of unpack the content marketing world, and we talk about in the book as well, once you build a loyal audience, you can monetize that audience in up to 10 different ways. And historically for content marketing, we've really just focused on a couple. Oh, we want to build a loyal relationship with an audience, and then we want to sell them more products or more services, or maybe we want to keep them longer as customers. But there's all types of different, we're seeing companies that are starting to sell sponsorships, they're starting to launch their own events. I, I shared this um, as the keynote, uh, during the keynote, that one of the most valuable events in the world is owned by Salesforce, it's Dreamforce. A lot of people don't realize that, 175,000 attendees, they sell millions of dollars in sponsorship. That is not run by a media company. The largest media company in the electronics industry is not a media company, it's Aero Electronics, it's like the Amazon.com of selling electronic components. Um, we know, of course, know of Red Bull Media House. I mean, all those things. And I think what a, what a lot of the sessions that I saw is that, look, we have to start thinking differently about this marketing thing because we the, the control has gone completely to the consumer. They can ignore us 24 seven. That means we've got to create regular, consistent, valuable content to them. And if we don't, they're gonna simply ignore us. I mean, that's the fact. It's, um, you don't have to do content marketing. I'm just telling you the facts. If you don't create information that your customers want, they're not gonna pay attention to you. So that's sort of yeah. the essence behind this whole thing, and we want to deliver consistency over time, and that's the best way to do it. It's kind of hard to argue again. Somebody might have, you know, a bad experience with the term content marketing, uh, just for the various obvious reasons. They they might have not have been doing it right. They might not have stuck with it long enough. Uh, they weren't consistent with it. Whatever, right? So, but it's pretty hard to debate that part what you just said of if you're not producing information that's going to be helpful and useful to your audience this interrupted marketing deal is going away it's 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 withering away so it's hard to argue with that now how you, that is what is your marketing with content so that's where content marketing comes from so the idea of it all is it's 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 it, to me it's just it's you can't debate it i mean it's it's unmistakable that it's the way to go. Now, how do you go about that? How do you learn about the methodologies? All of that is why we go to people like you and conferences like you to learn from. So I would like to talk a little bit more about audience building because sure. for people who are new to this, um, audience, you can go on Facebook and build an audience, right, and that you advertise to. So you might, we might be you know, not on the same page with everybody. So it's, dig into that a little bit more about what you mean by building an audience. How do you know you're building an audience? Um, and maybe an example or two. I mean, you've given some companies that I've done, but maybe one, one example of where, hey, they did this and they wrote about this and this ended up happening for them. Yeah, I mean, so um, we're we're thinking and acting more like media companies. We just don't monetize it like media companies. So every company in the world, whether you're a media company, whether you're a nonprofit, whether you're consumer or business com company, when it comes to creating content, so when it comes to creating a blog post, videos, when it comes to creating podcasts, whatever the case is, the business model is exactly the same. It's exactly the same. We're all trying to build uh, loyalty and trust with somebody so that they do some profitable behavior so they buy more stuff from us. Yeah. Now, where most people go wrong is they say, okay, well, we have this thing to tell. We want to talk about this. We've got the story to tell. Let's start creating content. Let's do some blog posts. Let's do some podcasts. Let's do some videos. Let's share it on Facebook and Twitter and whatnot and see what happens. You may get lucky and do well, but most of the time you probably don't because that's not how media companies over time have been successful. It's not how content marketing uh, great success studies have been successful. What we've seen is focus on one particular audience. So let's say we're talking about a B2B company, and a B2B company might have seven to nine buyers, influencers, decision makers in the process. You have to focus on one of those. Like, are you focusing on the main decision maker? Are you focusing on a gatekeeper? Are you focusing on an influencer in that buyer's journey somewhere? 
Focus on that one specific audience because if you widen it to cover more than one audience, you'll never create relevant enough content. Somebody else will, will focus on that audience and do it much better. And then once you do that, you're like, okay, well, what's that customer's pain point? What's keeping them up at night? And then where do I have the authority to create any kind of content at all? Mm -hmm. What's my differentiated story, right? We see this all the time with big companies and we work with a couple companies in the same exact industry, both billion dollar enterprises. And when you look at the blog posts that they were creating, they're basically talking about the exact same thing. So what's the differentiation? Nothing, neither of them were doing very well. They were talking about the same things as everyone else. So when we say, okay, we wanna deliver a differentiated story to a particular group of people, well, what does that mean building an audience? Building an audience means that they've given you some kind of opt-in permission let's say through subscribing to your email newsletter, that they would say, okay, yeah, please send me your information. They're basically subscribing to your marketing, although it's marketing so good, it doesn't feel like marketing. Mm -hmm. That's exactly what we're talking about. So they might say, oh, I'm gonna subscribe to your e-newsletter. And then every week you send an e-newsletter and they start engaging it and they say, wow, this company, they really know, they know their stuff. So that when that person is actually ready to buy, they probably will buy from you. They might not even look at another company because you've been sending them this wonderful information. I don't care if you're a real estate agent or whether you are Microsoft. The same exact things apply. We want to start off very simply focusing on one audience, doing one thing really well, the blog, the podcast, the video series, consistently delivering that over, over time and then being patient with it, but focusing on building those subscribers. And the last thing that I would say, because you brought up Facebook, is really critical. Nothing wrong with starting things on Facebook or Twitter or LinkedIn or anything like that, but you've got to remember, you can leverage social media to try to build those, if you want to call rented audiences, but Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn own the connections to those audiences. You don't own them. They want you to actually pay for them. So you just got to remember, you don't want to necessarily build your content ship on rented waters or content house on rented land, if you will because those companies change the rules. So that's why we focus so much on email, because right now that's sort of the best thing we have going. What are your thoughts on, I hear you. Um, I mean, I'm not surprised, but to me, you, you, uh, you stated that super clearly and uh, appreciate that. Now, what are your thoughts on, uh, I'm seeing a lot of trend towards this and I'm actually a fan of it, uh, is building like your private, your private Facebook groups. That's sort of like rented land, but not, not not really it's 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 oh, yeah. it is, but it isn't what are your thoughts on that because i think that's a great the two mediums that i'm push that we're looking to push people you know for this are email and then this facebook group especially if there's going to be ongoing communications and there's a lot of cool things you can do on facebook where you can start getting at the top of people's organic feeds right yeah. so what are your thoughts on that are do you look at that as rent land like a facebook group that you're building well first of all i think facebook groups uh, Facebook has totally stolen groups away from LinkedIn, mm -hmm. and they've done a great job at it. And I love Facebook groups. I'm in a number of Facebook groups, but the same thing applies. Tomorrow, so let's just say that you and I are part of this, or we start this amazing Facebook group. Uh, we've got 200 of our buyers involved in that. There's great conversation going on. And then tomorrow, Facebook says, ah, oh, we're going to kill groups because it's not driving enough advertising. Yeah. Now, they might not do that. They probably wouldn't at this point, but they could. Yeah. Because look at Google Plus, right? Look at that thing has just gone down the tubes because Google had no mission for it. And so not a lot of people are using Google Plus, at least as much as they were. LinkedIn Groups is another example. Groups were all the rage, and then sort of LinkedIn has kind of stayed away from modifying that and going forward with it. Now everybody's going to Facebook, and everyone that put their time into LinkedIn Groups, they're not as valuable as they used to be. So that's all I'm saying. I'm absolutely use it. Like if you're having success with Facebook groups, go to town on it. But what I would be doing as a strategy is if you have a Facebook group, make sure that you diversify a little bit and get some of those people to start signing up for some kind of email. Yeah, yeah and all you would need to do is, you know, alert people, you know, some from time to time on that. Yeah. And say, here's the reason is because we're going to be putting out this content over here on a regular basis. That's so, it. Give them something valuable on yeah. a different channel for them to sign up for. Yeah. Absolutely perfect. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that one, two punch is the key to audience building. And the reason I think the reason that Facebook is stolen from LinkedIn is, well, A, there's gargantuanly more users on Facebook, but it's just the way it works. And, and, and this, the best way to think about it is, 
is when you see a post of some one of your friends that they posted two or three days ago, or if you posted something two or three days ago, and then you randomly see somebody make a comment or like, you're like, how the hell did they see that? Are they lurking? Are they going on my – no, what happens is, is Facebook with their algorithm, with the engagements, be it likes, shares, or comments or whatever, starts to say to – the Facebook world, hey, this is something that you want to see apparently, so it's going to push it up to the top. And I think that's why these Facebook groups have taken over is because these conversations get started and you might miss it, but it's still going to be coming up to the front of your – top of your feed assuming there's engagement and stuff going on, which which is the whole – that well, needs to be happening if you're creating a group. Well, and the point the point to that, just to remember, yes, all about the – everything that you said is correct, but the only reason that they do that – is because that makes you a more valuable customer to Facebook. Yeah. They can monetize you better that way. That's why yeah. groups exist. If for some reason groups didn't do that or they start to wane and for some or they get too much spam. I mean, we've seen in the news recently Facebook is under all kinds of issues right now with fake news. That is not going to go away anytime soon. Mm -hmm. So, okay, if that continues to be an ongoing problem, there's going to be issues with with Facebook. So that's why when I, I talked to a bunch oh, of small businesses you. yesterday and, and they were like, we're putting all of our marketing into Facebook. And I'm like, that's fine. Just be careful. Just know that you're dealing with the devil, not that Facebook's the devil, but know no, that you, you just got one place you're, and if, if you can wake up tomorrow and it's all gone. Yeah. And to Joe's point here, everyone, it happened with Vine. Uh, Twitter Vine literally uh, stopped existing and people had built audiences and followings and then they were just SOL gone. Um, let's go back five years uh, or maybe more. I can't remember. Mm -hmm. But whenever Facebook stopped showing organic 100% of the time and it went down right. to 10 and then it went down to 8 and now it's like about like 3%. That's exactly uh, less than you, one now. Yeah. Or, yeah or <laughs> so so that, that, that ha and that could very well happen with groups. Yeah. Now, but the one-two punch, you know, uh, you know, be it Facebook or whatever or whatever you're doing, what Joe's suggesting is don't take that chance, you know, diversify, get, you know, build audiences and your everything's going well, then move them to your email, give them a reason to sign up for that, and then you can still do what you do, and then also get people signed up. And look your, at what the YouTubers life. are doing. YouTube's a great example. Look at YouTube rock, rock stars. They got 10 million subscribers on YouTube, you know what they're all doing is their calls to action, sending them back to their own web page to collect an email address because they're scared because yeah. YouTube could wake up tomorrow and take away their subscribers. Not that yep. they will, Yeah, but no, it happened. No, it, but it's happened. Yeah. It's happened. I mean, it's happened. It happened with Twitter, yeah. you know, and I, that was a huge deal for a lot of, I can't imagine if that happened to me. So yeah, awesome. All right, well, cool, man. I think we got a good idea about the audience, but now as far as building that, right? There's a ton of talk at your conference about being human, using empathy and emotion. Uh, and I know that might play into the, you know, what's your take, what's your opinion on everything, what's your spin, but um, I'm sure you heard a lot about this. Why, why don't you dig into that a little bit? It kind of goes with the audience building that we're talking about. Well, I mean, it's just good storytelling. I mean, you, have, you want to evoke emotion of some kind. Um, the more that this c content that you're creating really makes a deep impression and affects somebody's life. I always say, you know, the best type of content to create is something that helps somebody with getting a better job or living a better life. That's usually – you're usually just pulling at the heartstrings sometimes, even B2B companies. But what it, what is truly important to that audience, that's why – if I am going to do a content marketing strategy, I'm going to spend the first month understanding that audience better than anyone else. Because mostly when companies start, they're like, oh, well, I'm going to start talking about my product and service, and I'll start talking about all the important issues that we want to talk about. And then you find out your audience really doesn't care. They might care. They might want your product and service down the line, but you're trying to focus on problems. Basically, you're trying to fix a problem through communication similar to what your product might fix. If you're from a, coming from a B2B company, is a good way to look at it. So that's where you, you, if you spend more time understanding that audience, and that means figuring out what they're doing on, on social media, where they're going, going to Google Trends, figuring out what people are um, uh, clicking on, looking at, searching, meet with your sales team, call customers, meet with customers. It's the best thing that you could possibly do. Understand them better. If you understand your customer, com, uh, uh, customers better than anyone else, you'll be able to create content for them better than anyone else, and then you'll be able to keep that relationship going for a long, long time. 
Yep. Yeah, that's awesome. And you made some good points. And I actually was going to ask you, okay, well, how do you understand your audience? Well, you just gave a lot of good pointers on how to do that. One other thing I would add is to run a professional uh, keyword report yep. analysis. Find out, get get like three or four top competitors, get your own. Of course, you're going to really need to use a tool. You don't have to. You can go through Google AdWords if you have an AdWords account, but normally you're going to need to go through an Ahrefs or SEMrush or something like that. But um, you can figure out somebody who can do that for you. But, but that that way you can find out what literally people are searching for online. And then you take those, and you're going to have, at some point have to put on your logic hat. You're going to have to put on your, you know, what you know, what you know, what your company knows about your customers. But you, you've got to gather all this information. You go to Google Trends. You run your keyword reports. You talk to your customers. Then you, you know, then you put on your editorial hats, and you start thinking, okay, what can be compelling? What can be helpful? What will make their lives better? But, yeah, I mean, you gave a lot of good pointers on how to, how to get to that point. Um, awesome. Uh, all right, man, just to kind of keep moving along here about some of the stuff that I heard at the conference uh, talked about a lot. Um, and this isn't something that's brand new, but it seems to still be a hot topic, which lends me to believe that not a lot of people are doing enough of it, which is video. Uh, how have you seen people utilize video well? And, and do you have any pointers in regards to that? And do you agree with my assessment that – why are we talking? I mean, we're still talking about like, hey, you got to do it. You got to do it. It means must, most people must not be. So what's your take on all that? Well, I think most people are dabbling in video, but they're not taking it seriously is probably what I would say. Every, almost everyone has business of any size has a YouTube page, and they yeah. have uploaded videos, but they don't do what you're supposed to do, and that's you know, targeted to a specific audience, deliver video on a regular basis, just like you would a show, like a podcast show, a video series, just like any Game of Thrones has a, every, has a season every year. I mean, those are the types of things that work. And what most companies do is they think, oh, we're going to let's talk about th this video. They upload a bunch of video at one time, and then they stop. And then they upload a bunch of other video, and then a video here, video there. It's all inconsistent. It's all over different things. It's all targeting different people. It's just a shame. If you're going to do it that way, don't do any of it. That's why we talk about video so much at the conference, because it, there's none of that thinking put in in a lot of cases. Like, I'll give you a really good example. So um, Jenny Doan at Missouri Star Quilting uh, out of Hamilton, Missouri, started a YouTube channel on quilting material. This is as simple as you get. Didn't have a lot of budget, but every week she put out a video talking about a new pattern and a new thing that she was working on. And now she has two, over 200,000 subscribers. She's the quilting queen of the world. Hamilton, Missouri, the people flock to it like Disneyland now. She is the largest, um, largest employer in the city of Hamilton. This, all this stuff happened because she had a YouTube channel and she consistently delivered this really valuable, interesting information over time. Not rocket science. Just now, you, consistently delivered it every now, week. That was know, it. Built an wait, audience. Getting that ball rolling at the beginning and her just posting it, it's not like um, field of dreams, right? You just, you know, you build it, they will come. Do you know what she did to get that ball rolling on a limited budget to get eyeballs on there to get some engagement and get people, other people sharing it, hopefully, and which led to more and more? Do you know how that just, happened? Yeah, her? just started to tell her current that she had an audience of customers. She started to talk to them about it. Hey, this is available. If you know anybody else, go ahead and share it. It's very small to start with. Nobody hardly how, how anybody looked at the initial videos. I mean, basically, if you're going to do something like this, you're going to, it's going to be about six months of radio silence. That said, what you could be doing is you should be using some of your advertising and promotional dollars to promote this. I had a conversation with a company just a couple of days ago, and they said, what's the split between content creation and content distribution promotion? Like, what should I be spending? I said, it's at least 50-50, if not 30 creation, 70 promotion yeah. at, to start. And then once you build an audience, you can put more into creation and less into promotion because you already have your audience. Yeah. But, that, but it took time. It takes yeah. time. It's an asset. It takes us as a marathon, not a sprint. Yeah, and that definitely varies. If you're a big company and you're you have humongous opportunity, it's going to be a wider, wider gap between what you need to spend on the content creation versus what you need to spend on the promotion. Um, so yeah, if you're a big company, you're going to have a larger ad dollars, and you know, you know, writing super high quality articles and doing all that, it does somewhat have a cap on it uh, as far as what you really should be spending. Now, if you want to go deeper and do podcasts and videos and all that, you know, who knows what the budgets could be for those. But yeah, I mean, no, I, and that's a great point because it's not something that was discussed a few years ago, but now 
I think people are starting to realize you got to get that ball rolling and put some ad dollars. So if you are getting into content marketing, you don't just look at what it's going to cost me to, um, you know, produce the content in time. You're going to have to have some sort of ad budget if you want to get that ball rolling sooner than later. But at the end of the day, it really comes down to something's most likely going to take off eventually if you are targeting somebody specific with a specific, you know, like specifically helpful and educational or fun or making their lives better in some form or fashion. And well, you need you're what you're example. saying. Yeah, what you're saying is you need a marketing plan for your marketing. So yeah. that's what you have to do. You use some advertising. You might use do some influencer stuff. Uh, you you could do you know obviously you have pay per click in there. Uh, you you're you get, you're sharing it with all with in your existing channels it's on social. All those things come into play. But make sure when you have the strategy that you also say okay well how are we going to market this and get it out. A lot of people just focus on the content creation side. Yep. Awesome. All right. Now, moving on to one of the most stressful uh, pieces of information that uh, seems to be out there is this ROI-focused content marketing. Uh, it's been a big talk, at least I've noticed, over the last 12 months or so, or maybe a little bit more, because the C-level execs are wanting to see a return. And now we're talking about building an audience. Uh, that's the money comes after that happens, right? So help us with this. You know, if you help some marketers out there that are trying, like, what when we say ROI, are we talking about sales dollars and then attributing those to our efforts? Um, because that's what normally it would mean, and that's probably what it means, at least in some capacity. But there's more. There's other steps on this ladder before you hit the big box. So h help us with this. Help us with the where, where your mind is at with ROI focused content marketing. Well, the the first you have to figure out what your goal is. Now, if your goal is to sell more products, then yes, your return is probably some kind of sales percentage or growth or dollar amount. But it it is to get more sales opportunities, or if it is to uh, if it is to keep customers longer. Um, if it, you know, what, it, what is the goal? What, what do you, if you, maybe you're trying to do cross sales, maybe you're trying to increase yield. You know, those are all the numbers that you're trying to figure out. I'll, but the sim simplifying this whole thing is really easy. All you're trying to do is figure out if I deliver content, if I do this to a group of people, what, how has their behavior changed? That's, that's the return. So, do they buy more? Do they stay longer? You know, what, what, what are those behaviors? And that's what you need to figure out. Now, then a lot of people go to more van, what I call more vanity metrics and say, oh, we get social shares and we get traffic and uh, we get helpful on search engine optimization. All those, and all of those are fine. But then you have to take the next step and say, ultimately, well, are people that subscribe to our stuff, do they actually do some of the things we need so it helps our business? That's it. That's why I love, that's why we talk about audience building and subscribers. Because once somebody subscribes, then I can really start to measure it. Like what we know for Content Marketing Institute, we know that our best customers subscribe to at least three things we do. They're the customers that spend more money. So when somebody comes to me from corporate and they say, Joe, uh, what's the, why do you do the magazine? The magazine doesn't make a lot of money. I would say, well, those people that subscribe to the magazine and two other things are our most valuable customers because they spend the most. They go to content marketing world. They spend more money. That's the data that we've been focusing on. So, and Robert Rose is working on a ton of this stuff, right, stuff right now. But basically, it's how do you evaluate audiences? And when you deliver information to them, what is the value of an audience that you get uh, audience member that subscribes to something at the at the top of the funnel or something, or versus somebody that subscribed to more than a couple things or do. So those are the things that we're trying to figure out. But I don't want to get too crazy here. All I want to do is say when you start out with your goal, you want to say, look, the goal here is to deliver some kind of information to them, and at the end here that they have some kind of behavior change that's profitable for the business. No, I hear you. And, and there's some softwares. I mean, there have been out there. I'm sure. Um, but I'm starting to see more and more of, you know, attribution model softwares where you're able to track what all happened because a sale could happen way down the road. And then, you notice they touch six, seven pieces of your content and you're going to tell me that didn't affect that salesperson's ability to close right. them, you know, so like that's, that stuff's all coming out um, for, you know, it's bigger budgets, bigger stuff. But when you have that, 
you know, that's normally necessary for more information and more stuff. So you don't necessarily probably need to do that, you know, invest in something like that if you're huge. Now, what did you guys do over there, Joe? Because you have a huge audience. You have, I mean, you're traffic and, you know, I, I, I only can imagine how much, you know, you're having to sift through and look at. And how did you guys do that? How well, did you I mean, find out? Yeah, I mean, it's all it all starts very simply, and it doesn't take a lot. It actually, to start with, it doesn't take a lot of budget. It just starts with your, the email subscriber. That's our number one thing. So the goal of our website is to get or keep a subscriber. So it's not to sell anything, and that's what a lot of that's why we're different from a lot of companies. Like we're all I'm focused on is I want to keep the subscribers we have and keep them engaging in information, and I want to get new subscribers. And then once we do that. Then our goal is to communicate that with them over time and then to get them subscribed to more things. This is all we did. So I'm like, okay, well, we started with 10,000 subscribers. Then, okay, let's add the magazine. Let's get those people, as many people that make sense, subscribed to the magazine. Then, okay, then let's get these people interested hmm. in this topic. Let's get them now subscribed to our webinar series. And we do that, and then we go ahead and we do an analysis of, of our paid products, whether it's pay, paid training, whether that's going to content marketing world, whatever the case is. And we do an analysis, and we say, okay, this – who are the people that came to Content Marketing World? Oh, my God, look at They're subscribed to this and this and this. That's how we get our number of three. We do the analysis. And yeah. by the way, it doesn't take a lot of big software. I mean, it does take we, – we did it initially without any automation products at all. We just did it through, oh, I got spreadsheets and emails and just figured it out. Now we do use marketing automation. It's a little bit better. But you don't have to wait for the technology to do this. You just need to get the subscribers and then figure out who's buying and who's not, and it can start to tell you some something about what you're doing. I hear you. And, and I, w I want to touch on something that you said a bit ago about does it mean more opportunities. I, I have um, gone to Lunch and Learn recently, heard it at your conference, heard it somewhere else recently. Uh, it's really big in the B2B world is you know the lead scoring and, and those being delivered to sales because, uh, again – CEOs, they talk about ROI. So they want to see sales numbers, and they want to. And then the next thing they might want to see is like how many opportunities and leads are actually coming in. Well, that doesn't paint the full story. And what might end up happening there is people stop investing because they think it's not working, and then they just shot themselves in the foot. A, they wasted all their efforts, and B, they stopped something that was probably working currently and about to start working a lot more. And so what I what I've seen a lot of people doing now, especially on these B two B. Uh, models is delete scoring and then delivering those to sales team. Now, a lot of people are doing that already, but not everybody, and not everybody is attributing that to your content marketing efforts. But I'm telling you, I'm hearing it so many times. I'm seeing it myself with uh, one of our clients and that we work with, or two of them, actually, that we work intimately and in, 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 um, in talking about this. That is a direct correlation to your content marketing efforts is those score. More people are scoring higher now, and your sales team is closing more of those. That's, that's part right. of this equation. Oh, so, absolutely. Is. That's, yeah. a great, that's an absolute great point. I mean, but what you want to do is you want, only want to give your sales team the most qualified, the most qualified. Names, yep. so they can stop wasting their time on top of the funnel stuff. Mm -hmm. So depending on what your goal is, this stuff can take care of all the top of the funnel. And we worked with one company that knew that they did not send anything to sales until a prospect touched eight different pieces of content. Mm -hmm. It's just that, but I mean, doesn't yours is the, everyone's is different. Yeah. But in this case, they found the number was eight because that, that created a certain kind of prospect that was ready for a conversation with the salesperson. And then that way the salesperson didn't waste their time. They're just focusing on doing what they're supposed to do. Close the deal. Yeah. And thank you for bringing that up. I actually heard that in one of your conferences, uh, one of your sessions that I was at. And, and that's what they were saying is they want, and this, I guess this is coming from the ROI focused content marketing push from C level execs is they want either more sales or they want more leads. They want more leads. They want more leads, more, more leads. So what, people were doing was they were lowering that threshold and marketing was lowering the threshold uh, with their, you know, white nugget just like pissed off at that, that they're having to do so because they know it's not the right thing to do. So hold strong, you know, hold strong, just let them simmer, you know, find it out. You're going to test it out. You know, you could start, you could lower the threshold of the lead scoring and see if anything happens, you know, if, you know, you got to play around with it. Just like Joe said, you never know. Is it two pieces? Is it 10? Is it 20? You don't know. But once you figure that out, Hold strong and, and don't live a little lead. You have less leads, but the salespeople are going to be wasting their time. And you're well, you, be, you're not going to stop a lot of your traditional stuff. Like if you're not going to go all traditional marketing and then go cold yeah. turkey 
and and you're going to go all the content. No, it's not no. going to work that way. You, no. you need to sort of do a little bit. You need to do a pilot. You need to do some testing, and you need to do a lot of education in your organization because this is something that most of your marketing team or your executive team they don't know what they don't they won't even know what you're doing because yeah. it's so no. different and it changes no, change is the hardest thing. Yep, and and I love that point you just made. Yeah, don't stop what's working. <laughs> you know, don't yep. stop what's working. Just take the stuff that isn't quite as working as well, and add in you know add in some online digital, you know, on the content marketing side. All right, now this is a this is a curious question here because I'm, I don't know if you're going to have any answers because no one really does yet, but maybe you do. Uh, artificial intelligence. What do you expect? How, how do you see this? you know, being utilized in the digital space or the content marketing space. Do you see anything coming up or is it, are we still in a wait and see approach? Oh, no, it's absolutely going to be huge. I mean, it's a continuation of what has happened with automation and you're, you're going to, I mean, there's already, I mean, look at what the Washington Post is doing. They've had, they've had thousands of articles automatically um, generated uh, through bots and people are reading, humans are reading this right now and a lot of them can't tell the difference. Um, and then, so, and then everything is going to be hooked up to the Internet of Things is a thing. It will actually happen. But so I said specifically for marketers, don't worry about all that right now. What you need to worry about is educating yourself and being more strategic. Because if you're focused on tactical things like, oh, I can do this SEO thing or I can do this social media thing, that's fine for now. But the ones that are really going to win, that are going to stick around and why – marketing is in its golden age right now is the ones that are really strategic to understand how all these things work together because you can add all the technology you want in the world but people still want to receive great information and they want great experiences that doesn't change if technology can help you get there then you leverage that technology but if you don't have the story in the first place it's not yeah. going to matter it's a great point yeah how how, we're, how and where we're going to use it when it comes out, it comes out, and you'll figure it out. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's just a plug. It's just another bullet for your gun, so to speak. You know, it'll so. change a lot of things. Don't get me wrong, but I'm saying if you don't have the basic building blocks right now set, like mm -hmm. basic strategy, don't mm -hmm. be don't be worried about your tech, because most everybody runs to tech. Like, just think of all the people that have invested in marketing uh, automation over the past years. And almost every implementation has failed to start with because the brand's not ready. They don't have a good strategy for it yet. Mm -hmm. Then they got to fix it and they figure it out after time and mark, and then automation actually works. Yeah. But they're not ready for it. So make sure you have a good strategy first that makes sense. And then when you really feel that technology will help you get to the next level, then you do it. Gotcha. And again, to reiterate, strategy you re referencing is finding out who your audience is and then finding out really, really how you can be compelling to them. I mean, that's... That's a big beginning. Now, there's lots of nuances in there. You can do your content marketing vision statement and figure out all these details. But in a nutshell, you've got to figure that out. And then from there, you can figure out. I mean, yeah, you're right. If you're using marketing automation and you're delivering a bunch of crap, well, <laughs> what's the Doesn't point? Matter. Right? They're getting yeah. lots of crap now, right? So yeah. what's the point? All right. Now, you mentioned the golden age of content marketing. Do you see this still growing? I remember last year, it was the trough of – Disillusionment. Disillusionment. Yes. Was that what it was? It, uh, where are we with this? Uh, we're yeah, we're in the area, the age of the haves and have-nots. You're seeing some of the greatest content marketing case studies you've ever seen right now, and you're also seeing a lot of companies that are saying it doesn't work. It's a fad. It's a buzzword. Don't do it. Those are the ones that honestly just don't do it right. They don't get. They're not patient enough. They don't understand it. They're they're not different. They haven't differentiated their story. They're targeting too many audiences at once. They change too quickly. They're focused on campaigns. I mean, we see it every day. But the ones that stick with it over the long term, they have a long. It's a long term part of their strategy. It's going to be incredible. I believe that the future business models of organizations around the world are going to come from building audiences. They're going to come from this thing we call content marketing, um, and we're already seeing that happen. So it's just it's just going to take time. Gotcha. All right. Now I know you're not big into the Martech, but did you? Is there anything new that you saw that was intriguing to you this year? Oh, I mean, it's all. It's you know. What but I know, but you know what I mean. Yeah, I mean, big, I you, you talk about the stuff that's most important, and I get that. And I didn't mean to think that you're you sour on technology. You know how important they are. You're I right. love that. I mean, shoot, we wouldn't have a conference without all these wonderful technologies. That would yeah. be that would be great. I mean, for marketing automation to workflow tools, calendaring tools. Mm -hmm. um, we, I mean, some of the sophisticated. Uh, search algorithm stuff that that's going on at the conference, uh, the writers networks. I mean, those 
things are all fantastic. I mean, it just depends on what your need is. And some people need those things and some people don't. So if you're really having issues in the organization with project management and communicating and governance, you probably want to look into a workflow tool. If you're having, if you have, if you don't have any idea about where all your assets are, you probably want some kind of digital asset management tool. So it's, it just depends on what the challenges are. Focus on one at a time. Um, they're all really, really good, and we're all going to need them at some point. But you don't probably need them all to start. Now, here is there any 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 new one that that comes to mind at all that might be new to all of us? No, I think that it, I mean when you mentioned the AI stuff that's happening. Uh, the stuff that, I mean, I'm totally intrigued by the natural language search processing yeah. and what's going on there. That, it's not revolutionary. It's been going on for a while, but it's starting to be used now. Like, for example, if you're into fantasy football and you get a whole, uh, so after you lose that week, they send you a whole pair, you know, a couple paragraphs yeah. of how you did. That's all <laughs> yeah. automated. It's like a human being doesn't send you that, right? It's all automated by, and it's amazing. And but you need, the, yeah, you need the data to do that and all the information, yeah. and it's truly outstanding. And of course, we have some sponsors that were there that do some of that stuff. So if you, ha yeah, if you're trying to scale some of this stuff, the AI component is a real thing. And I would just say, if that's something you're interested in, what what Paul Reitzer is doing over at the the Marketing AI Institute is just fantastic. Um, I mean, it's it's cutting edge stuff all the way. Very cool. Yeah, you don't want to read my my last two reports on my uh, my fantasy football team. Oh yeah, mine either. <laughs> I can't. Oh, it's terrible. It's yeah, terrible. Totally I'm, I'm like, I'm like, again, the worst in the league. I don't know. Uh, I, need, I need, I need to start doing some research. Yeah, we need to stop playing fantasy football. <laughs> I used to be good at it. All right. Well, cool. All right. Well, uh, anything changing before I have to let you go in the next twelve, twenty-four months that you see? A any big predictions you have for us? Uh, I, I still think that that you're going to see droves and droves of acquisitions happen. It doesn't even need to be big companies. It's small companies. I mean, the media companies out there, blogger sites, influencer sites, they're going to be bought and are being bought right now by, uh, by brands. Mm -hmm. the, the, the future of media, like it or not, is going to rest in the hands of corporate America because they have the budgets to invest in these types of things and it's and the business models of media. It's not the engagement levels are not down. It's the advertising is down. People aren't spending money on advertising. It's not supporting these vehicles anymore. So a lot of these are going to be purchased by, uh, by that side of the house. And I think it's going to change a lot of things and we probably need to get prepared for that. So that's the one thing that I keep my eye on all the time. I mean, just look at what happened at the Emmys. I mean, who won all the Emmy awards this year? Amazon, uh, Netflix. I mean, are you kidding me? I mean, just think about how that's changed. These are platforms that are that are that are corporate platforms that are creating the content that we're engaging with that are winning awards. And, and now, so it's you, just now, now who, who's dipping their toe now? Apple was it? Apple, yeah, just right. committed to at least a billion dollars in original content. Yeah. Google's already gone there. Facebook's already gone there. They're all media companies now. So, I mean, just just look at what these companies are doing. Yeah. So, yeah. And, that, and that you made a pointer within a pointer there uh, for bigger businesses th that might be listening to this. And you want to get into this, how you can fast track is find an influencer or a blogger or a publisher who is speaking to your niche already and already has your niche and employ them. Basically, you're you're buying them, but sometimes it's worked out. I've seen people, they actually just get employed by that company or whatever. So that's a way you can just fast track your way to your marketplace and you have somebody who has an intimate knowledge of your marketplace and then you just strategically you know, figure out how you're going to work in you know, your initiatives into that. So Yeah, just find out where your customers are hanging out already and yeah. it'll save you a lot of time. Awesome. All right, Joe, I hate having to leave you go, but it is time. Uh, how can people continue to learn from you? Uh, yeah, so anything from Content Marketing Institute, contentmarketinginstitute.com. The new book is called Killing Marketing. Go to killingmarketing.com or Amazon, Barnes & Noble, all that good stuff. And then I'm probably best accessible at Joe Polizzi on Twitter. So that's J-O-E-P-U-L-I-Z-Z-I. -Z -Z -I. All right. All right, Joe. Really appreciate it. And uh, until next time. Anytime, my friend. Thanks. All right. Bye-bye.